and for wildlife. And the emerging message is that butterflies and moths are spreading their range. He's keen to encourage people to get and explore the parks and green spaces around them and for the boroughs to do more to make our parks a better place for wildlife. Uh, Simon is the chair of the Surrey and South West London branch of Butterfly Conservation and a committee member for the London Beekeepers Association also. Simon, we're delighted to have you here. Um, please, over to you. Oh, <laughs> Simon seems to have disappeared. Simon? Are you there now? Okay, yeah, we can see the presentation. Yes, we can, yes, we can see the presentation and we can hear you. You can't see me? Yes, I can see you, yes. Okay, so as you as we were practice then. Okay, good. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Lovely to be here with you. Um, uh, I will. I'm here to talk about the butterflies of South London, and I, I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute. Um, you'll see in the presentation there are quite a few pictures of butterflies, photographs scattered through it. Um, these are mostly pictures I've taken, and they're mostly pictures taken locally, many in Bridges Park, if you know that, in South London, and mostly with my mobile phone. So the point of that is to show that you don't need a fancy camera in order to take reasonable pictures of butterflies um, uh, if, you, if you try hard. This is a large skipper um, butterfly. It looks a bit like a moth. Uh, it was pictured, photographed in my garden a year or so ago. Very surprised to see it there. Oh, hang on. So, as um, Lucinda said in the introduction, um, this talk is really about deb debunking some myths. And one of the myths around London is that it's no good for wildlife. You've got to go out into the countryside in order to see, to see any, any good butterflies or anything interesting. And I, my purpose is to show that's simply not true. And I think it's getting less true as we have in the last few years. But it's also an encouragement for people to explore the green spaces near you rather than going out to the countryside. The parks near, near you, I'm sure, uh, are actually quite good for wildlife. Uh, and as you can see, this picture on the right here, that's a common butterfly on Burnsfoot Trefoil, pictures in Burgess Park, which is only a mile from Elephant to Castle, as probably many of you know. So I use a hashtag, nature under our noses, to say, if only we look, then we will find lots of interesting stuff um, in terms of wildlife uh, nearby. Um, I think Lucinda has already covered this, um, but I thought because it's an online presentation, you can't see me, I should have a picture there and just talk to you, mentioned that I grew up in rural Dorset, where that's one of probably the best places for butterflies in the country. The Isle of Bebek, um, recently retired. Um, and as you can see, I've been doing various monitoring of butterflies in the local area. Um, and I, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's the Twitter handle which I, which I use. Um, this is what we're going to cover. As you can see, I'm peppering the presentation with photographs of butterflies, a, a small tortoiseshell from Burgess Park, and the Red Admiral from my garden in Cunnington, um, two butterflies which you can see quite often. We're going to talk about the wildlife sites in London, then we're going to talk a little bit about the butterflies you can see in South London. I'll talk about what's changed since the 80s, because there was a book published in 86 um, called The Butterflies of the London Area by Colin Plant. It was a definitive text on the butterflies you could see, um, and things have improved since then. Um, I'll illustrate that with a few success stories about three species and a couple of sites. I'll mention a butterfly conservation is working on with the London Wilder Trust and the Natural Museum called Butterflies. But then talk a little bit about why London might be quite good for wildlife and then what we can individually do. Uh, wildfly meadows are always of interest, verges and gardens and parks and so on. I'll talk about the Big City Butterflies project that Butterfly Conservation is trying to get started uh, next year, and then we'll have some conclusions. So that's what that's the kind of thing that you're going to be learning about in this next 40 minutes or so. 
Um, this is the area which I'm really focusing on, and I, I kind of call this metropolitan Surrey. I don't think that term exists. When I googled it, it didn't really come up. But if you if you know much about the history of London and Surrey, Surrey, the county, used to go right up to the River Thames. Um, and when the GLA was formed, then these bor these boroughs were carved out of it, and the boundaries have changed somewhat since then. But especially south of the Thames and west of New Cross Gate would be the sort of area we're talking about. It includes the three inner London boroughs of Wandsworth, Lambeth and Southwark, and the five outer London boroughs, which you can see there, Richmond, Kingston, Merton, Sutton and Croydon, but only part of Richmond, the bit that is west of the Thames, Spelthorne, is not included in this area. And this is the, this is the area which the, the Butterfly Conservation Branch that I chair covers in London. And as you can see, the inner London boroughs are quite distinctly different from the outer London boroughs in terms of the population density and the amount of green space. About twice as many people per hectare in the, in the, north, in the inner London boroughs and much less green space. So, but, even, but most of my data, in fact, comes from the, the green spaces in Wandsworth, Lambeth and Southwark, and I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that. Um, if you want to know what a hectare is, it's about two and a half acres roughly two football pitches if you can envisage that. So it's a reasonable 100 meters by 100 meters. So that's the measure. Okay. Um, in that, what, so, so the question next is what habitats have we got for wildlife in South London in that area? And this is a, a, a um, section of a map produced for London National Park City uh, by Urban Good uh, a couple of years ago now, showing the green spaces and the different shades of green have, may have different meanings. But generally across the area, um, we've got parks, commons, cemeteries, gardens, brownfield sites, and a lot of transport corridors. Um, there is, in, in here, I think if my you can see in this, in this area, towards the left, we've got Richmond Park, National Nature Reserve, Wimbledon Common, Putney Heath. And down here, which is the North Downs dip slope, so the shallow part of the North Downs, um, some chalk uh, outcrops, and that's in the new South Downs, South London Downs National Nature Reserve. And in between here, you can see all green spaces like uh, Regent uh, Hyde Park, um, Party Park, uh, um, Clapham Common, uh, uh, Tooting Commons, Mitcham Common, etc. And you see the white spaces, which is Croydon in Morden. So you get an idea of the area which we're talking about. And one of the interesting things about the, the, the green space in this area is there are rather few land managers. Um, the boroughs can manage most of the land, the parks and the cemeteries. The City of London Corporation manages some of the land here, particularly down in the southwest, southeast, I'm sorry. Um, then you've got London Wildlife Trust, the Trust for Conservation Volunteers, a bit of National Trust like Morden Hall Park, the Royal Parks. Um, and of course, the friends groups play a major role in how these how these parks and these parks are managed. So it's relatively few people to interact with when you want to make changes, which is unlike the countryside outside London. Um, just a word on butterfly monitoring now, um, and this is a speckled wood butterfly I, I, I took with my mobile phone on Tooting Common, not far from the cafe, um, about three or four weeks ago. Um, the questions you want to know when you're monitoring butterflies or any other wildlife really is what's there, where is it, when is it appearing and how many are there. And so we're talking about both distribution and abundance. So distribution is the what and where, the abundance is how many. And um, a lot of the stuff I'd be showing today is about distribution, site surveys, species surveys for either adult butterflies or caterpillars or, or eggs, casual records submitted by individuals. And one of the questions you want to know there is, is there a breeding colony or is it just a, a butterfly flying through the area? In terms of abundance, we mainly measure abundance using a fixed route transect, which is a, a, a butterfly monitoring walk. And I'll show you a picture of those, um, the ones in the area in a minute. But you can also do time counts for adult butterflies. You can do egg counts or counts of the number of caterpillars. But if you want to get really busy, you can do capture, mark, release, recapture studies so you see a number of individuals in a colony in a site, and that's done when people are doing PhD studies and detailed ecology work. So this is 
um, some of the fun motoring sites in South London, the area we're talking about, those eight boroughs. Um, each of the tree symbols is where there has been or is still a butterfly monitoring walk, a transect walk, and the dots, the circles with white inside is, is where there's monitoring but not a formal transect. So if you wanted to go and see wildlife in this part of London, the, the, this list of places will be probably most of the best places to go. Um, and you can see um, not far from um, uh, Bell House, you've got uh, Dulwich Park, Bel Air Park, Dulwich, uh, and so on, uh, which are being monitored quite closely. So in, the, in a butterfly monitoring transect walk, an individual or group of individuals sometimes would walk that route. Typically, it's a route of a mile, mile and a half, maybe a bit more, uh, every week um, from April through to September, so 26 times in a year. Uh, and they would record the numbers of butterflies they see in the, as scientific a way as possible. So it's to try and get a measure of the abundance um, uh, of, the, of the butterflies in that, in that site. Um, over the last few years, we've increased quite considerably the number of sites being monitored. So Cannon Hill Con, for example, I started monitoring this year, wasn't done before that. Just Park is only last year and this year. Um, Dulwich Park, similarly. Brockwell Park is also relatively new. So we're getting a big handle now on what's going on in these places uh, where butterflies are flying in South London. And I think this is probably, if you think of, you know, this is the southwest corner of London versus the southeast and the northern parts of London, I think this area is probably better studied in terms of the data than there's other four quadrants of London. <clears throat> So now we're going to talk a little bit about what butterflies you can see. Um, I'm not going to do an exhaustive study uh, of all these, but I'm going to try and group them into uh, um, categories uh, that make some sense. So there are five butterflies which hibernate um, in the winter as adults, and these are those five. Um, the Red Admiral is, can be seen on almost, actually records that are reported for the Red Admiral in the top left corner here. On, um, in every month of the year, and, and sometimes on New Year's Day or Christmas Day. So whenever you get a warm, warmish, sunny day in the winter, these butterflies will come out. They'll be feeding on the ivy in, uh, in October, November, when the ivy is in flower, along with a lot of the bees, the ivy bees as well, ivy mining bees. Um, and they don't, I think they, they don't really hibernate properly. They, they, they kind of can appear anytime. The peacock and the tortoise shell I think they've already gone into hibernation, most of those. They tend to hibernate from August onwards. And I think that's because they are really butterflies that prefer a cooler climate. And as soon as it gets warm, they go into hibernation and they, in sheds, outhouses, clumps of ivy, whatever, uh, under the eaves, and they will uh, be there unmoved um, and not eaten by spiders or birds or anything generally um, until the spring. When, they, when it gets warm, the days get longer, they will come out, they will mate, lay their eggs, and, um, and, and still fly for some weeks, sometimes months. So these butterflies can be flying as adults for almost a year. The comma, which you can see below the peacock there, with very distinctive raggedy edges, quite common in this part of London. There are, there are a lot flying in Burgess Park, and some of the more woody areas, and I'm sure the other parks as well. Um, this butterfly will, like the others, um, will hibernate, come out in the spring, breed, lay the eggs, its eggs on um, nettles or elm trees or hop. Those caterpillars will go through to, to chrysalises and they will emerge as a summer brood uh, and then they will, they will also lay eggs and, and you'll get another cycle. On bottom right hand corner you've got the brimstone butterfly, that's a female which is a bit greener, the male is the bright yellow one these caterpillars feed on buckthorn. Um, so those are the five which you can see first in the new year. I'd love to see them when the weather starts to get better. Um, then we've got the white butterflies. And these, some of these would be called cabbage whites. These can be quite confusing. It's quite difficult to tell these apart, even for experienced people. Um, on the top, you've got the large white and the orange tipped female, which doesn't have any orange on its wings. Below that, you've got a green veined white, a small white, and a brimstone female again. Um, these were um, all shot fairly locally. I think most of these in Burgess Park. Um, 
or or Tutin Common or someone like that. Um, and you see the green vein right is distinctive because it's got these marks on the veins underneath. The large white large white has this larger black area here, and the brimstone has these these very distinctive wing shapes. Um, but these can be quite tricky to tell apart. The commonest butterfly of, of these is small white. And if you see a white butterfly fluttering along the streets, it's probably a small white. They're almost everywhere in London. Um, they are the survivors. They will eat your brassicas, but they eat lots of other stuff as well. Um, but these, these are really prevalent. Then we get to little brown jobs, as I call them. <coughs> um, on the top row, are the skipper butterflies. I mean, you remember on the first slide I showed you a, a large skipper. There's a large skipper here. I was in my garden. This one's in Burgess Park. Uh, it's, it's proboscis, its tongue is a drinking nectar in the thistle. Um, these are these quite some of the called primitive um, uh, family of butterflies that are actually quite like moths. And the distinction between, between butterflies and moths is quite arbitrary when you look at the taxonomy. Um, then you've got two butterflies here, which are very, very similar. They were thought to be the same species for a long time. The Essex skipper and the small skipper. The total difference about the fact that the Essex skipper has got these very black tips to its antennae, um, like they've been dipped in ink, and the small skipper does that. Um, also, the Essex skipper bends them into as an egg, and the small skipper as a caterpillar. So that's another difference between the species. On the bottom, you've got... Um, a different family of butterflies. You've got a brown argus, which I've got a success story about, um, which is a lovely chocolatey brown, tiny butterfly. Then the common blue. Um, this is female. The males are bright blue. The females range from brown like the brown argus to half blue like this. And the small copper, which you can see on the grasslands, uh, in parks, and that seems to be doing quite well as well. All these you can see in the parks around London. Two, we have two blue butterflies in London. You can see it in, in the parks and gardens. There are others further south, which I'll talk about. But the common blue and the holly blue. Um, the common blue I talked about before. This is the male top left, a bright blue butterfly, um, and the female, two different forms there, all partly blue and, and mostly brown. Um, again, um, distinctive, distinctive, and, I, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about those being in, in Burgess Park and other parks later. The holly blue, you'll see flying in your gardens, it fl flies higher up often. This is the female, it's got that brown, that's a black to its wing tip. And I'll manage to catch one laying eggs, um, well, there are several females actually laying eggs on lucerne plants in um, Burgess Park this year. Um, and that was on that was uh, a first for me to see that. Uh, but the, the holly blue lays eggs on holly in the springtime, and then those butterflies um, those come through to butterflies, and then later they will lay eggs on ivy. But actually, they will use anything up to 170 different plant families that feed on lots of different things. But it's a good reason to keep ivy in your gardens, is that the holly blue uh, loves it as to a lot of butterflies and things for, for taking shelter. I'll talk about that a bit later on as well. So there's the holly blue and the common blue. <clears throat> and there are some species that are really hard to spot, which spend most of their lives at the top of trees. The white letter hair streak on the left and the purple hair streak on the right. The white letter hair streak uh, feeds, caterpillars feed on, only on elm and the purple hair streak on oak. And these can be seen in June, July, August, flying around the tops of um, the trees, if you know when to look. Um, uh, and th these are seen across the parks. Um, so someone's asking whether butterflies come out at, at, at night. Well, butterflies don't come out at night, but moths do come out in the day. Well, that's not quite true, actually. Some butterflies do. Come, if you have a, a light trap, you can catch butterflies in it, as well as moths. But we can come to that in a minute. Um, and then you've got the brown butterflies. Um, and I've shown six here. The, the, the gatekeeper at the top left is small, loves to feed on um, bramble, uh, nectar on bramble plants. The meadow brown comes out a bit later, bigger, flappier. The speckled wood I showed you a picture of before. 
Uh, the marbled light, that's another success story we'll talk about. Um, the ring, not so commonly seen, but still there. And the small leaves, likewise, in the bottom right hand corner. So these pretty little butterflies um, need grassland, um, grassy areas to, to thrive. The caterpillars feed on grasses, uh, which is why we need to have wildflower meadows with grasses and the grass left to grow long and stay late into the year. Um, yeah, I think that's what I say there. Okay. And then we've got some migrants. Um, despite Brexit, we still have migrants coming into the country as butterflies. And there are three here which are which are welcome visitors. The painted lady on the left, that was in Burgess Park by the car park um, earlier this year. Sometimes the painted ladies butterflies come in vast numbers, as they did in 2009. They start their journey from Morocco, North Africa, gets too hot for them there. They start to move north. Uh, they lay eggs on the way and, and they can breed from egg to adult in about six weeks. And so you get a succession of, of butterflies flying north through Spain, France, Netherlands, um, up into Scandinavia sometimes and across into Britain. Um, and they, they will, um, you'll, so you'll have the parents, the children, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren of the original ones um, coming, sorry, not parents, but the, the parents and their offspring will be reaching these shores. So you can at the same time see very tatty specimens and very, very new specimens because they've bred on the way. The Red Admiral again in the middle, and that one's feeding on a black, ripe blackberry. Um, and that used to be a migrant only. It now feeds, breeds here, and spends the winter here, and, and caterpillars feed on nettles. And then you've got a clouded yellow, which is not seen so much in central London, but if you go to the outskirts of London, which we'll talk about a bit later, you see that, and quite a few were seen this year and last year. Lovely butterfly, uh, flies very fast, quite hard to photograph, which is, that one, which is why that one's not mine, probably. <coughs> and recent sightings, so these, these butterflies, which are not really in a London residence, have been seen in the last year or two, the, the, the White Admiral, the Brown Hair Streak, and the Silver Wash Artillery, all seen on Teton Commons um, and one or two other places. Um, the White Admiral's Honeysuckle, uh, which, is, which is quite a lot of that in some of the parks. The Brown Hare Street needs blackthorn, slow bushes. And there's lots and lots of that around. And the Silver Wash Artillery, caterpillars feed on violets, but it flies quite a long way. So these may not be breeding colonies. They may just be butterflies flying, flying through. So we're starting to see more butterflies coming into this part of London than we used to have. But if you go back to uh, 1986, this book by Colin Plant, Butterflies um, of the, the London Area, um, published in 1987, that listed 21 generalist species in Inner London, a slightly different definition of Inner London than we use today, but it listed most of the ones which we've talked about uh, so far, as well as the wall brown butterfly, this one here, which is now absent from the area and it's declined nationally very significantly. So that was, so if you go back, that's what people were, were saying you could see in, in, in London uh, 30 years ago. Um, now the, the, the amount of monitoring and recording of butterflies has vastly increased since then, I, I think. But nonetheless, I think we'll see that the, there are now well over 25 species and the ones in blue were not on that previous list, the brown argus, which you've seen, the two hair streaks, which you've seen, Marbled white and uh, and ringlet um, are all been seen in the in the in, the, in, in inner London, not just in the leafier parts of outer London, but in inner London. Inner London. And just for fun, I put a picture here of um, an Essex skipper. You can see Essex skipper because of the black tips and antennae um, with a crab spider. These spiders um, um, rest in wait in the flower heads of plants, and when butterflies or or other insects, hoverflies. Uh, uh, nectaring, they will jump up, jump and and, and uh, bite them with their fangs and immobilize them, and that's the end of the butterfly. Um, not a very nice way to go, I expect. So this, these are the success stories I want to just talk about. Um, the white hair streak, and uh, this picture here is a um the marbled white, and the brown argus. And then we'll, I'll talk about two parks in Southwark, Warwick Gardens, a very small one, and Burgess Park, probably one of the biggest in the borough. 
uh, both of which have improved, have, have shown their own story about wildlife you can see um, in London's parks. So firstly, the white-letter hair streak. This is, a, as I said, a, a small and elusive butterfly that lives only on elms um, and it was hit very badly by the Dutch elm disease in the 70s. And people thought that the elms were wiped out of the countryside, um, but actually that's not true. In this part of London, there are a lot of elms in the parks, in the roadsides um, and everywhere. Um, and uh, they're quite hard to spot. Um, but as you can see from this picture taken in Battersea Park, in March, April, when they're in fruit, they're quite conspicuous. So they, they, they sh they're almost like a beacon shining in the, in the hedgerow or, or, or in the woods. Um, so what we did was we, we got the databases of trees from the borough tree offices. They were kind enough to share the information with us. And they listed the locations of elms with a grid reference. Um, we then went and checked those, out, checked those out in the spring when they looked like this. We looked at the GPS for them, um, which type of elm it was, what condition it was in, did it have Dutch elm disease or not? Um, could you see the canopy? Because that was quite important for monitoring the butterfly and built up a, a sort of set of um, databases of that. Went back in June and July to look for the adult butterflies and also then in the winter did some searches for eggs, which were quite hard to find, but we did find some. And we reported back to the borough ecology office on what we found. And they were pleased to know that this butterfly was present where they hadn't known it was present. Um, so as I said, there were lots of elms in South London, in the in parks and cemeteries, different types of elm, English elm, witch elm, um, Huntington elms, um, all sorts. Um, and the boroughs have been planting disease resistant varieties, cultivars, um, uh, did that from uh, five to 15 years ago. And many of these, these elms now have um, what are the history colonies. So Tooting Commons, various commons in Tooting where there are um, both, both um, English elms, witch elms and disease, resist disease resistant varieties. It's a very good site for the white hair streak. It's probably uh, one of the nationally larger sites for um, the butterfly. But you can see them at Peckham Rye Park by the Sexty Garden and at Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. I'll show you a picture there. And that's what you're looking for, a butterfly that's sitting on a leaf at the top of an elm tree and it will fly off. Two males will, will another male will fly into its air to fly off um, to uh, fight each other for the territory. Quite distinctive and uh, there's no doubt when you see that, that, that you've got the white letter hair streak there. So this is the distribution of the butterfly in 16 to 18. Um, we've not been doing quite so much recording in the last year and a half. Um, but these squares are a tetrad, a two kilometer by two kilometer square. Um, and you can see it's pretty much everywhere. Um, I think actually there should be a square filled in. I found it in Southwark Park up here as well. Um, but if you go back to the, the time from 2007 to 2015, it was only recording three tetrads in this area. So a lot more recording. And that's obviously significant, but also probably a spread of the butterfly, um, as well as London's got warmer and so on, um, and more elms have been planted. I don't know how they do it, but they seem to find the, find the, the, the elms and, and build a colony there. <coughs> and this is the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens area. If you notice at all, this is the multi-use games area in, in Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens with MI5 to the left. And there's a stand of cultivar, almost new eyes and elms around it. I guess she's around 25 feet high now. Lovely trees. And the white letter hair street flies above them, particularly over the far end from where we are looking in this picture. Because you could hardly get more urban than this, but the butterflies don't seem to mind. Uh, we didn't know they're there until we looked, but we were pleased to find them. <coughs> now that, excuse me, now the marbled white. This is a, um, a success story across much of Surrey, and in fact elsewhere as well. Um, but it's been seen now in many parks in London where it hadn't been seen before. It likes tall, unimproved grassland. The caterpillars feed on red fescue grasses and others. And that's a picture of the red fescue grass there on the right hand side. Um, and you can see from this chart below that the butterfly is flying only, imago means the adult butterfly, only 
for a short time in July. Only typically that you'll see them on the wing for a couple of weeks, three weeks maybe. Um, nearly all its life is spent as a caterpillar uh, all the year. Um, and that's why the grassland areas are so important to the success of this butterfly. If that grass isn't there, the fescue grasses are not there and they're not there through July, August, September, then you won't have the butterfly. It will go into hibernation um, later on in the year um, and come out when the grasses reappear. Um, but a lot of the time it's dormant and a lot of the time it's as a caterpillar, which I, I think is amazing. This is the trend in occupancy. Occupancy means is the butterfly present in that tetra, that two, two kilometer by two kilometer square or not? And you can see in, you go back to 85, 86, it was in less than 10% of the squares and now it's in more than 65% of the squares in the area. Uh, it looks like the rate of spread is increasing rather than decreasing. Hard to fathom why, except I suspect there's better management of parks and gardens um, as part of it. It may be due to global warming as well, I don't know. It may be due to the urban heat island effect, effect in London, possibly as well. If you want to see more data on these sorts of things, then you can click on the, um, the reports that, the, uh, that we've produced in recent years for butterflies and their distribution in London. Then the brown artist. This is a different story. This is the underside of the brown artist. It's a butterfly. Um, it's now, I've seen quite a few in Burgess Park, it's present in Tooting Commons and elsewhere as well. But if you go back a few years, the books say this is a butterfly that lives on chalk downlands and its caterpillars feed on rock rows. So what's it doing in London parks where there aren't any chalk downlands and there isn't any rock rows? But for some reason it started using geranium species like this does put a crane bill with caterpillars. But if I, was, I showed you pictures of them with the raggedy wings that used to feed only on hop and elm and obviously then not much hop around. There used to be lots of hops in the air with all the brewers in, in northern parts of Southwark um, and there's quite a lot of elms around. But when it then was able to use um, uh, nettles as well, or instead as for its caterpillars, it then started to spread much more widely and is now quite common. So a different success story and for a different reason I think here. Now we're going to talk about two, two parks. Uh, the first is Brook Gardens, just because um, this is such an interesting study by, it's only a one and a half hectare park in Peckham, not far from the, the station, two and a half acres, no, about four acres, sorry. Um, so a lady called Penny Metal studied this over six years, go visiting the garden, garden the, the gardens most days, uh, taking pictures of what she saw and she found 555 different species of insects and spider in the garden, in Morick Gardens. And she wrote a, a blog about it and a book about it, which I thoroughly recommend as an interesting read. And it's a testament to there is nature under our noses if we, if we only look. Because um, you can see here, you wouldn't expect there to be lots of insects and spiders in this, in this park. But they're all around the edges and in the wild areas. Um, fantastic job and, and, and I'm so impressed by, by that. And then you've got Burst Park, which is my, my kind of my local park, which I've, one I've monitored most closely. It's been transformed over the last few years. Um, a lot of money spent on it, obviously, but um, a lot of thanks are due to the council, I.D. Verdi, who are the, 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 the managers under contract, and the friends of Burgess Park, who, who've been supportive of, of um, improvements to the habitat. Importantly, it's got several different types of habitats. So you've got lots of pollinator banks created there, which are through the summer. You've got wildflower meadows um, and you've got scrubby areas and wooded areas. And this is good for the butterflies, it's good for other insects and because you've got the, the, the butterflies and the plants you've then got lots of birds there as well and, and bird monitoring has been done in the park is actually now a, a very good area for, for bird life as well. So 22 species of butterfly, all the ones I showed earlier could be seen in, in this park but also as I said birds, bats, other, other insects like the bee fly, the hornet hoverfly, the rose chafer and so on. So it actually has become a pretty um, good wildlife area. And as I said, only a mile from the the castle. This is a case study on, on how things can be done and, and what happens when you just spend a bit of time looking after nature. Now we're going down to that area um, south of Croydon. The, the area I showed has got the, the 
the South London Downs National Nature Reserve. And you can see the monitoring sites here, which I've listed. Um, some of you may know these. Some of these are, 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 are triple SI, sites of special scientific interest. Um, and, and a lot of good, very good ones are in this area, um, both in the, in the US side here and over here by Hatchetons Bank, John Bank, and, and, and uh, Selston Wood. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. So this is, this is the South London Downs National Nature Reserve, which is a big area, 417 hectares. And it's, and it's not quite continuous, but it links up a lot of areas of, of uh, high quality green space, Riddles Dam, uh, Farthing Dam, Happy Valley, there's a triple SI, Coulson Common, Kenley Common, New Hill, and the Sandstead to Whiteleaf countryside area. Um, and these are managed either, either by Croydon, the borough, or the City of London in the City of London Commons, like Coulson and Kenley are. Um, there's some really good areas for wildlife here. And also in this area, you've got Hutchinson's Bank and Chapel Bank, two reserves managed by London Wildlife Trust, right on border between um, Croydon and Tadbridge. The, the, the bank goes somewhere along here. There's a dry chalk valley. There used to be a river down here in the in the distant ancient past, and it's a haven for butterflies. It's it's one of the few pieces of good chalk grassland in in London. More than 37 species of butterfly are found here. Uh, lots of wildflowers, lots of orchids are found here as well. It's a well-monitored site, well-managed site. Um, it used to be essentially a rabbit farm back in the 1950s. It was just plain grassland. And then it was left uh, when myxomatosis killed off the rabbits, it was left and it scrubbed over. So it was like, like the scrubby area all the other side. And none of Wildlife Trust over the last 30 odd years have cleared parts of it. So you have a mosaic habitat of um, some ancient woodland, some secondary woodland, some scrub, and lots of chalk grassland. And all the butterfly right here, a lot of work has been done um, to, to help it. Uh, and it's probably a, a nationally important colony of small blues. It has the highest count of small blues on any transect in the country um, uh, uh, as to, to, to prove that. And this is a project which I mentioned earlier where, where um, Butterfly Conservation is working in partnership led by Nash, uh, London Wildlife Trust but also with the Natural History Museum to improve the, some of the wildlife habitats in, for butterflies in that South Croydon area, but also to create new habitats in the community, in schools and roadsides and so on, um, so that the small blue butterfly and others can uh, can thrive. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about it. It's only a two-year project. Um, it was paid for by the by the People's Postcode Lottery. It's 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 fabulous. It's got a great team working on it. But if you go to uh, the link here, go to the London Wildlife Trust or Butterfly Conservation website, click on the links, you can see information about it. And if you're in the area, you can get involved. And it's great. So summary so far. Um, Butterflies appear to be spreading a range in London, and there are more species than there were some time ago. Um, and that seems to be true for other species groups as well. And I could we show some reasons as elm regeneration, change of larval food plant reasons, but but there must be other reasons why that's happening. I think there are other reasons. Um, and these are three examples: butterflies and moth, a moth from um, the local area. So if we, let's go back and see why insects have been declining. Um, in this report, Insects and Wildlife Matter was, was commissioned by the Wildlife Trusts in uh, 2019, written mainly by Dave Gulson, the bee expert, bumblebee expert. And, and three man-made stresses were identified as causing most of the insect declines, well, as being most responsible. One was habitat loss, habitat de degradation, habitat fragmentation. And that was due to development or change of, changes of land use. The second was ag agriculture, the intensive agriculture, which we have pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, neonicotinoids, monocrops. Um, and the third was climate heating, uh, with things getting too hot. So that's the reason for the decline. And if you look at um, uh, London, some of those things don't apply. Um, despite the development of in London, it's quite green. The green spaces are quite stable. 
the, the footprint of the parks and cemeteries and so on aren't changing, even though people pave over their front lawns to park their car or build patios and brownfield sites get consumed. But, but the parks and so on um, are, are pretty stable in terms of their boundaries. They're just getting buildings getting closer to them and more people using them, as we saw in lockdown. The transport corridors allow wildlife to move through very easily. The boroughs don't, the councils don't use much chemicals in their parks, um, certainly in ones with numbers, so that there's very little chemical use. They do on the streets, but in the parks, much less so. They're starting to have more sensitive management of parks. I talked about wildlife areas, um, uh, different plants being planted and the different mowing regimes. And then specific to London, you've got a couple of things. One is the urban heat island effect, where it's a lot warmer than the surrounding countryside. Uh, not time to go into the details of that, but four degrees, seven degrees, maybe even more um, warmer than, than outside of London. And there are some limitations on development in terms of biodiversity net gain and urban greening factor. We can go into those, if you like, uh, in Q&A. This picture of a moth which we may have seen from around here and others. It's called the Jersey Tiger Moth. It first appeared in London, well, actually in, the, in, in England, um, uh, outside the Channel Islands, so mainland England, in 2004, in Forest Hill, um, and now we're seen everywhere across the south southeast. And you see a lot flying around in, in July, August. Uh, this one is in Kennington, my garden, and I get a lot of them. So this is, this is, to, just to summarize what I was saying about London, you will probably know it's, it's quoted as saying 47% green space, 22% green belt, about a quarter of the area is gardens. Um, there are 1,500 sites of importance nature conservation, local wildlife sites, that's about 20% of the space. There are 143, 143 local nature reserves, three national na nature reserves. So you've got Richmond Park, Rice Lip Woods, and the South London Downs. Um, lots of issues across the Brownfield site. So, um, and this map, if you haven't seen it before, is a great map which shows all the green areas in London, like Pinot, or Richmond Park, or, or um, Hyde Park, etc. etc. et um, So London is quite green. So if you want to take do something for insects, the, then the Wildlife Trust have got an Action for Insects um, uh, website or area on their website, and they use this hashtag. But I just want to pick out five things that you would do if you wanted to, to think about how you would use make your garden or your park better for wildlife. The first is thinking about food for, it's only five points, food for adults. So you want nectar plants available uh, and, and and pollen, pollen net, plants with pollen for bees and other things as well, actually, not for butterflies, but for bees and other insects. Um, throughout the whole season, you can get lists of those from, from places. You need food for the, for the kids, as I call it, so the caterpillars need something to eat. It's a different group of plants. They need somewhere to shelter, both overnight, in bad weather and over the winter, I've shown you that. And you need to stop using chemical, chemicals because insecticides kill insects. It's something to do with name. Uh, and if you want to really increase biodiversity in any pond, however small, will be a really good thing to do. And I guess the point to remember here is if it's good for insects, it's going to be good for other wildlife as well. This is an example of an orange, orange tip butterfly, the egg here on the that little um, orange egg, that was probably in Burgess Park. Um, as talking about shelter and overwintering, um, for 24 species of butterfly breeding in inner London, five of them, as I mentioned before, spend the winter as an adult. Three of them as an egg, that's the two hair streaks and the Essex skipper. Six of them as a chrysalis, mostly the white ones. This is orange tip about to emerge. You can see a lovely shaped chrysalis there. And, but most of them spend their winter as a, as a caterpillar. So they're very sensitive to what the grassland and areas are like over the winter. So you need to think about the whole year. Uh, if you want caterpillar food plants for London's this is a list. Um, this is Coxfoot grass picker. Grasses, fine grasses, not the coarse rye grass. Nettles, nasturtiums, brassicas, bird's foot trefoil, garlic mustard, sorrel dock, cranes foot, dust, dust foot crane's bill, thistles are great. The thistles are great because the painted lady butterfly. Uh, Caterpillars use the thistle, but a lot of butterflies use it for nectar. Ivy, again, for nectar and for the holly blue, and trees, especially oak, for the 
Purple Hair Street, Buckthorn for the um, Brimstone and Elm for the Whitehead Hair Street. So you can do a lot um, for, this is many parks and all big gardens. If you've got a small garden, I suggest you focus on, on nectar plants, but if you've got more space, these are the things you think about or to encourage your local parks to, to do. And this is what I mean by management of the parks. Now, I, I know this is a winter picture on the left and someone on the right, but if we just park, this area was just made basically be grassland, bare grassland, not much on it uh, three years ago. Last year, around the east, the waterland there was just buzzing with insects and full of butterflies. Um, it's great. Um, and it wasn't difficult to do. And better just like doing more of that in the coming years. Uh, if you want to create flower rich meadows and grasslands, the key is to have a low nutrient soil. That means that. Um, the, you don't get lots of plants which crowd out the, the, the ones you want to grow. This is Hutchinson's Bank, this picture, and you can see this area on the right hand side was, um, uh, is as it was, uh, un, un, unmanaged if you like. This area on the left has been the topsoil scraped away to, re to reveal chalk. That was done about five years ago. No cutting or maintenance has been done on this area um, in those five years, so you, you've just got kidney veg and other, other fine plants growing there, and it's full of small blue butterflies. Here on the right hand side, this was cleared uh, three winters ago uh, mechanically back to the grass, and you can see it scrubbed over completely. That's the effect of soil fertility on what's happening for, for um, wildlife. Um, so, if you want to reduce soil fertility, an easy way to do it is called cut and clear. You let the grass and foliage grow quite long, you cut it and take it away. Um, and repeat that. And every time you cut the long grass and take it away, you're taking the nutrients out of the soil. And after a year or so, you can get down to a, a high quality wildflower meadow, um, which you cut late in the season as if it were a hay meadow in the old days. Uh, just a word about the Big City Butterflies project that Butterfly Conservation is starting up. The, we've done year one development phase that was paid for by the Heritage Lottery, the National Heritage Fund. This project seeks to inspire Londoners to discover butterflies, moths, get them connecting with nature and to explore their local green spaces. Um, and the other project will go in at the end of this year when the lottery opens for new funding applications. So look out for that next year. It'll be in our area and it should be good. Uh, just to, finally now a word about resources online. If you have these, they're very useful. On the left is the iRecord Butterflies app. It's available from the app stores for Apple and, and Android phones. It allows you to using some very simple ID charts. Uh, and then um, using your, your mobile phone, just record what you've seen, either one butterfly or do a survey of an area or whatever. It's great fun. It, it, it doesn't cost anything. Um, and it, it, it helps you just know what you've seen. If you're having trouble identifying butterflies, this is near me. App is not really an app, it's a website, but it behaves like an app, which is available at this link here. And as I think was said before, you, you'll get access to the slides, so you can, you can see these links uh, later. This provides a list of what's been seen in your local area recently, last few years, from the, from the butterflies for the New Millennium database. And it's just a good way to, to know what you might see. and. Um, it's your head start, if you were. Some conclusion, um, there's lots of wildlife in London. Um, if you explore your local green spaces, you'll, you'll find them. Um, submit your sightings online, as I just said. Do something to take action for insects, either in your own garden or with landowners and managers. And I've shown you what you can do there. And if you want, to, the best thing we can do is encourage wildflower meadows, and that means changing mowing regimes and look at the plant life projects, you know, um, Burgess, Road Bridges campaign, cut late, cut less and cut later is, is what you need to do. Um, this picture of Rockwell Park, look on blue taken a couple of weeks ago. The message here is build it and they will come. If you create the right habitats, the butterflies are moving in. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty surefire win. I need, these are the people I need to acknowledge um, in who, who provided information or done stuff which has enabled either the talk to happen or the butterflies to be there. So the, the butterfly conservation 
uh, charity, the volunteers who do all sorts of work, the Friends of groups, London Wildlife Trust, the boroughs, and not to forget the Natural London Natural History Society, who's done an annual butterfly report, and they're producing an atlas of butterflies in London, which should come out next year. And that's it. That's I'll leave you there. Um, you've got my email and Twitter there, some links if you need it. But nature under our noses if you only care to look. So I think take a little bit longer than than the headline, but for questions now if people would like to ask questions. <laughs>